you know, things that we all can do that most people will find benefit from. So that's what I really want to stress is that I don't think that this is just going to get us to all of our goals, period. But I think if we, we start here, it's a good place to start. And I will do, try to do the math, too. <laughs> You'll be mindful. Of time. Okay, Plenty I'll be mindful of, of time. Yeah. Though, so okay. <laughs> Keeping everyone here all day over Memorial Weekend. And I will pass out some handouts when we're finished, too, that goes in a lot more detail than I'm going to talk about today of these eight strategies. Hopefully I'll get to all eight, um, but there's more detail and description in the handouts. So if you're interested, feel free to take a look at that. And my contact information is on there too for any questions or thoughts that might come up along the way. So the first one, and it sounds so basic and so elementary, but I cannot, cannot, cannot stress it enough, is hydration. Um, research shows, and I really see a parallel in my, my practice, is that about 80 to 90% of people are dehydrated at any given time which is pretty astonishing, especially because we're in a lucky, for the most part, um, society where we have access to water. Think about the societies that, that don't. Um, and it's not so much like, wow, I went for a hike and I didn't drink enough water and I didn't refuel enough. Um, you know, that's gonna happen. It's more on a chronic level. So when we're not getting um, enough hydration day to day, we're really lacking any kind of ability to function fully. Um, every metabolic process in our system relies on the, the water composition that we have, um, hormone balance, um, bowel movements, dare I say it, um, digestion, just really everything comes down to hydration. So it's one of those basic levels. That I, I had the most adorable 90-year-old client come into my office probably like a month ago, 90, cute as a button. I love old people. Um, and he was drinking. I'm like, well, how much water do you drink? You know, we were going over his laundry list of concerns that he really was motivated to, to change. And it wasn't towards the end of the session, I'm like, gosh, I haven't even remembered to ask him about his water. I'm like, how much water do you drink? And he's like, one. I was like, one, one what? He's like, oh, like one glass. I'm like, mm -hmm. like a day? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, like, tell me how big this glass is. And he's like, yeah, like that. And I was like, oh boy. And long story short, you know, it's really uncomfortable to add water in. And he slowly has been doing it um, over the last several weeks. And we've checked in, um, and we had a couple, one more session since then, and he has pretty much eliminated at least four of the symptoms that he came in to see me. So, again, I can't stress it enough. Um, so half your body weight in ounces. It's probably more than maybe some of us are doing. Uh, but really, that's a great place to start. And for us that are really active, um, when you're not feeling well, when you're sick, when you're stressed, even more. Um, so don't feel like you have to change that today. You know, really looking at kind of over the next several weeks, being mindful of, about, about how much you're starting at. And once you have a number in your mind, we just naturally kind of gravitate towards being able to change that behavior. And it will feel uncomfortable at first. I will say the, the, the water stays a little bit outside the cell, so we feel a little bit more bloated, but that usually will change for anyone making those big changes with the water. Um, the second strategy that I've really found to to be something I'm repeating over and over again to, to people looking for changes in their, their dietary or their lifestyle um, components is um, eating real food. It's again, sounds like a really basic idea. Um, I use the term JERF, just eat real food. It's a good way to remember it. But if we are able to really get down to the most natural components of how food was developed, we're really allowing our body to, to recognize food, to be able to di digest it fully, therefore we're able to absorb nutrients fully, therefore for what we're able to eliminate toxins fully. Um, and unfortunately, unfortunately, however we want to look at it, over the last several decades, we've really become a culture of convenience and um, you know, plethora of options, which is great on some level. But with that has come a lot of changes in just the processing of our food that there is even processing of our food, and that's always gonna be here, and um, that's okay. But, you know, in my personal opinion, I think if we can get back to the most natural forms of the items that we're eating, it really does set us up for a completely different situation. So when I look at fake foods, um, it's really this processed food categories, refined sugars, refined flours, um, uh, oh, industrial seed oils, um, is, are, are the three categories that I really see as kind of the culprits of what I believe, based on research and my own kind of looking at the pictures, is where people are really finding increase in a lot of the chronic diseases out there. So if we can just focus on those, 
it really will take away this chronic level of inflammation, which we know is connected to almost every disease of the modern world. Um, it really helps us get back to a level that we're able to get foods that are most um, nutrient dense, meaning they have the most value for the calories that we're receiving. And by doing that, we're really avoiding packaged foods. You know, you're, you're avoiding things that you can't pronounce. So if you're looking at that ingredient list and you're like, I don't even know how to say that, let alone know what it is, probably you don't need it. Um, there's always gonna be exceptions. And, and also I think for the most part, you know, first of all, number one is if it doesn't have a food label, it's probably the best option for us. Um, and if it has less than five ingredients, it's kind of a good rule of thumb. And again, there's always gonna be exceptions, but when we're trying to at least kind of get to a better place of making those decisions, um, I always will have all my clients kind of ignore, uh, my personal approach is ignoring calories, fat grams, all that good stuff for a time being until they can just focus on the ingredient list and find what it feels like, again, just to eat real food. So that's number two. Number three, um, I know a couple of people already kind of alluded to this, but the power of micronutrients is unreal. And we talk, at least I hear so much, I think part of being in like the, the, the high performance world and um, just in our society in general, this idea of macros, count your macros, um, which is fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. And there's definitely something to be said about that. I, I think that, that like some people really find um, it helpful to, to find an energy from those three macronutrients that works well for their body and their activity level. Um, and I think it's really only a small portion of the picture. Uh, so when we think about macronutrients, so basically they're giving us energy in the form of calories. So calories are energy. That's how you need to look at it. And that's the, the purpose that it's serving. It's keeping us living. So without energy, without calories, we literally cannot survive. Now micronutrients are gonna be like vitamins, minerals, um, phytonutrients, all the other stuff that are kind of behind the scenes, they don't get enough credit. But those are providing us with the absolute raw materials that we need to function. So every cell in our body needs those raw materials in order to do its job. And what's happened, mostly because of this whole idea of that jerk thing I talked about with not getting enough real food and getting too much processed food, we've really lost a lot of our nutrients along the way, which has really resulted in more disease. So deficiencies in these nutrients really can be hugely detrimental that people do not connect. Um, there's been research on, for example, seizure disorder. I have a couple clients with seizure disorder right now. There's, there's um, a lot of studies on like magnesium deficiency. And not to say that that's the cause and effect, we always take everything as a whole picture but really to, to recognize again, back to this chronic level, um, how important that is. Now, that doesn't mean that every day you have to make sure I'm getting my RDA of vitamin C and my RDA of B12, but really, you know, over the longer term of trying to get as much variety as we can, as much uh, produce as we can, um, is really gonna help us reach that micronutrient level. And I think like eating the rainbow, for example, with our produce is so important because every color, every um, vegetable and, and fruit is gonna offer something different. So it's farmer's market time, a great time, an opportunity to get out there and try new things. Like, I don't know what that is, I'm gonna buy it. You know, and, and Google it. Find out what you, how you can cook it. Ask the, um, if you're at the farmer's market, ask the person selling it, you know, experiment with things. Worst case scenario, you didn't like it, you can check it off your list, guess what? There's, dozens and dozens of other varieties out there. Um, so number four is the importance of quality. So all these things kind of piggyback off of each other. Um, so now that we've, we're getting our, our water in, we're trying to lower, if not eliminate, processed foods, we're making sure we're getting enough local produce um, to get our micronutrients in, we also want to start looking at the idea of our sources. Um, I'm a big believer and it's, Unfortunately, not good enough to just eat something that's good for us. It has to also be um, from a good source. And we really, really have to think about that in 2017. Um, you know, getting a quality um, chicken breast is very different than a conventionally, you know, raised chicken breast that maybe was fed a really poor diet, raised um, really inhumanely. Um, that's really going to reflect on how we receive it and really has been associated with even how much nutrients that we're getting. And on top of that, when we're not getting quality sources of, of our foods, we're also getting in toxins, pesticides, chemicals, hormones, 
which um, there's always going to be differences of opinion out there, but I am well beyond compelled enough to say that I truly believe that they have disrupted us completely. Um, even when we look at things like, um, you know, soda pop, we really became a nation of diet pop, and now we're finally seeing a trend that people are pull pulling back from, like aspartame, um, because of the, the, the associations that we're finding. So we wonder, you know, the things that haven't been out long enough, what are we going to find? Um, another example is food coloring. You know, so it's not, it's more than just like, wow, I get to make these really cool looking, you know, foods and baked goods now. What is that doing to us? And what we're finding is association with ADHD, behavioral problems, a lot of, of scary stuff. So really looking at what we're choosing and where it's sourced, how is it sourced, to add into gaining more nutrients and lowering our toxic load. Um, we are never going to be perfect on our exposure to toxins. We're breathing in them right now. I hate to break it to you, and that's okay. We're built to be able to handle it. Our bodies are some amazing things. The problem comes with the load that we're, we've been given at this point, and if we can lower that um, by making the choices that we are, we're, li we're really going to be able to detoxify those more effectively. Um, let's see. And for anyone interested, on the handouts I'll pass out, and my business cards are up here too. My email's on there, and I totally forgot to print it out, but I made up a food quality guide because there's a lot of confusing terminology out there. Um, there's a lot of marketing ploys um, that companies are able to use and get away with because they're not legally binding. So like, for example, the word natural has no, no whatsoever um, legal binding to put on a product which is really scary because people are like, oh, natural, this must be awesome for me. And it really has no um, you know, requirement to be there. So I put together a, a, a guide that helps us make the best decisions. So feel free to email me and I can send that to you. Um, number five is blood sugar uh, stabilization. So this is a big one for me that I see a lot and, and not necessarily just for people that maybe are struggling with um, like diabetes or pre-diabetes, although those are, of course, needing to focus on blood sugar stabilization as well, but really just the normal population. Um, I know we talked already in, in various of the, the examples of the speakers with the kind of the, the cycle that we've gotten on in a culture um, of maybe like, oh, I'm losing weight, so I should probably cut back and maybe go huge time frames between meals, but then all of a sudden I'll binge or, you know, and we've become really um, all over the place with our eating behaviors. So that's one thing that has really fed into the instability of our blood sugar. And then also kind of back to the, the, this whole idea that they all piggyback off of each other, those processed foods really can destroy the ability for our, uh, one of the things amongst others is the blood sugar regulation because um, what happens, so we eat, and anytime we eat, we're gonna have a release of insulin, and even more so when we're having higher sugar content. And sugar is usually not just like, I'm not sitting down with a spoonful of sugar, that for one doesn't sound very good, but it's usually in other forms. And our insulin gets released to bring that glucose, that sugar into our body to be used. So when we're having a huge amount that is brought into our body, body at one time, that increases our insulin. And you know, it really creates the cycle, not only in the moment, but th over time, that changes our hormonal um, balance and equilibrium. And that increase of, of insulin has been associated with, of course, diabetes and insulin resistance, but also weight problems, people having struggles with, with weight stability, with mood changes, with chronic inflammation, um, with a lot of different things, even like changes in sex hormones, that's a big one as well, because they're competing hormones, insulin and sex hormones. So our goal is to really try to eat um, frequently, and now that's different for everybody, but usually every three to four hours seems to be a good place for most people, but listening to your body, and it will change at different times in our life as well. Um, also, I'm a big believer in for most people to eat breakfast within 60 minutes, if not 30, of waking up and really focusing in on a protein to start the day. Um, and then also avoiding those artificial sweeteners. That actually, in my opinion, I would rather have someone have just straight up sugar than to play around with the splendors of the world. Um, they're actually like upwards to like 5,000 times the, the sweetness level of just plain sugar, which still creates that cascade. We still have insulin released, and on top of that, we have no sugar to bring into the cells. So the body's like, whoa, 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 what's going on? So even though we have zero calories, it still creates this hormonal kind of cascade of problems. Um, Number six, this is a big one for me that I work a lot with, with clients on, is 
uh, feeding the, the health of the gut. So the, we really know that gut health is one of the main things that creates either health for our entire body or kind of sabotages it. Um, in fact, the gut is known as like the second brain. Um, it's so connected to our moods. Um, about 80 to 90% of our serotonin is our, in our gut. And I, I don't know about you guys, but like I grew up thinking like, oh, that's just my brain chemical. And if I'm depressed, therefore it's all in my brain. I need to take some kind of you know, boost for that. But a lot of research has gone into, for some, not everybody, um, it could be an imbalance in the gut that's happening that is not allowing us to, to have those neurotransmitters um, flowing in the, the, the optimal level. And then also, well, I'll, I'll say two things about the gut health I think are really important. One is the microbiome, which is just a really fancy way of saying like the balance of the bacteria. So we have good bacteria, we have bad bacteria, and it's constantly kind of at a place that's trying to, to, to keep a balance there. And of course, we want the good guys to win. And with the changes of our lifestyle, meaning more stress, for example, um, faster eating habits, also like less eating, uh, the consumption of like traditional foods that would give us good bacteria, we've really had a lack of, of that good bacteria being put into our system and an increase of the bad bacteria that's kind of winning. So we really want to focus on ways that we can build that. And then the other component of gut health that's so important is our gut lining. So our gut lining is really, it's really this amazing thing because we have this whole digestive tract. Um, I won't go into all the scientific details, I promise you. But anyone that wants to geek out later, like feel free <laughs> to find me. Um, but like our gut lining is really this amazing kind of uh, lining of cells that are supposed to keep you know the, the things out that's not supposed to come in and the things in that are not supposed to go out. And really, we're not supposed to have any kind of food particles, for example, to go out the gut lining. We're supposed to fully digest, and those, those nutrients are absorbed in the lining, and that's how we get all that nutrient absorption. However, with, um, with a lot of different things, like medication, certain medications, um, with stress, with food sensitivities, with a lot of components, it, there's damage that happens. And eventually, that gut lining just becomes annoyed, inflamed, and some of those particles can be released into the bloodstream. And that creates a whole new cascade of problems that go beyond just, I have stomach upset, or my bowel movements aren't great. It really can affect every system of the body. So it's, it's really important to nourish our gut lining. So the good thing is, it's going back to what we already talked about. So really eating real food, trying to eliminate those processed foods, um, trying to get in more those probiotic rich um, natural foods such as like kefir, kombucha, um, sauerkraut, Pro you know for, for some people probiotic supplements can be a really helpful component as well. Um, you can take that into account. Um, all great things to, to really consider for your own health. I know I'm going a little bit over but just two more things to note. I won't harbor on too long. Um, they're not ne necessarily nutritional related, but everything is connected. Um, stress management is absolutely like part of this. You can have the most perfect diet, the most perfect workout routine, and if you are not finding what works for you to manage your own stress, it's really, you're only going to go half the distance. I truly, I, I can't stress that enough, no pun intended, but I've had clients where we are just like they are working so hard and they're so frustrated and they scale back on their workouts because they're overtraining and they lose that extra weight that they didn't to realize that was keeping it on. Or someone that finally prioritized or a busy mom and finally prioritizes that 10 minutes a day to step away and take a deep breath and, and have that time um, and really finds that their sleeping gets better. So not to underestimate the proactive step, steps that we can do for self-care and stress management. And then the last one is quality sleep. Um, I know that's easier said than done for some people, but it's usually, you know, with, with any kind of sleep problems, it's, it's to me a symptom. It's not necessarily a, a condition. There's always a reason why these things are off. That's where, what I believe in, with functional medicine, is our body's communicating something to us really important. And it's more than just, oh, wow, I should probably go to my doctor and maybe get that sleep aid. But I would ask questions of, hmm, you know, what has always been like this? What has changed? Um, am I going to bed hungry and I'm waking up and my, my blood sugar might be off? Am I going to bed really full and uncomfortable and my di digestive system is working really hard and disrupting my sleep hormones? Um, 
Am I not doing the basics such as shutting my shades or having blackout curtains? Is my room too warm? Um, some people, or research shows that like sleeping at 66 to 68 degrees is actually the best place. So really kind of going through this checklist of how to get quality sleep to go back to this idea that everything is connected and that equilibrium of the body feeds off of each other. It's always trying to find a balance. So if one thing is off, the body's gonna be trying to compensate of how to fix that and it's gonna shift the, the focus somewhere else. So to live optimally, to live joyful, to live balanced, you know, really take it into the whole picture. So I know I sped through eight really, really important things. Like I said, I have a more thorough handout for those that might be interested, but thank you so much. And let me know after when we go over questions if you guys have any for me. Thank you.